with that, I want to introduce Jeff Nyquist, an author, journalist, and analyst. He has provided some of the best analysis of communism and its influence at current world events. He's also the author of the book Origins of the Fourth World War and the New Tactics of Global War and the Fool and His Enemy, jrnyquist.blog. Jeff, it is great to finally have you on Patriot Radio today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I really want to dive straight into this subject because, again, very few people I've found out there talk about uh, these subjects. I want to start with Anatoly Galitsyn and talk about his predictions. I mean, according to one source, there's a book written about that, uh, Mark Reibler, that says that he was accurate with 90% plus precision on what he predicted and actually happened after he said it when he wrote his two books. Let's talk a little bit about who was Anatoly Galitsyn and also what is the import for us today as Americans? Well, Galitsyn was a uh, KGB major who was in uh, KGB counterintelligence. He worked initially in Vienna uh, then he he was in a think tank in Moscow when they were reorganizing the KGB. Uh, in 1958, Khrushchev uh, replaced um, the head of the KGB um, with um, a man named Alex, Alexander Ironshirk Shelopin. And Shelopin was a protege of a KGB general named Miranov. And Mironov was a believer in the Sun Tzu strategy, that excellence in warfare is winning without fighting. And he believed that the Soviet Union needed to create a fake liberalization. Now, they had done this before under Lenin. It was called the NEP. It started towards the end of the Russian Civil War as, as that war was ending in the early 20s. And it was a retreat into capitalism um, where they and along with that they had a fake monarchist organization controlled by the secret police then under felix Dzerzhinsky, to convince the west that the communists were no longer really in control of the soviet union in the 1920s uh miranov wanted to do this on a massive scale and he was pushing this in a um there was a committee called the brezhnev headed by leonid brezhnev under khrushchev in that met in 1957 and they were creating this new strategy because if you know your history the hydrogen bomb and sputnik came around in 1957 and sputnik really was an icbm and indicated that you could put a warhead on a sputnik and you could hit washington in 30 minutes which meant that everything was going to change america and russia were both going to get these weapons so how do we avoid a nuclear war how do we take down the west so what you have to do is you have to have a massive peace offensive in which it looks like communism has gone away. And this was Miranov's idea. He got his man in as head of the KGB, and there was Galitsyn on the, on this, in this group with them. And Galitsyn actually heard them planning several operations, one of which is a fake split with China. Uh, the other one was a fake liberalization of the Soviet Union, and this would take decades to prepare. They spoke about it. And of course, they had to reorganize the KGB so that there was an inner KGB who knew the strategy that would never be allowed to leave Russia and an outer KGB that, that would never know the strategy that if they defected, it wouldn't matter. So I want to talk about that specifically. He was talking about a, a restructuring of the Western mind and the perception toward the Soviet Union Let's dive into that a little bit because I've seen so many folks uh, that, that are posting on Twitter that have bought into a lot of what Galitzin said was the lies that they wanted to put on, we wanted to foist on the world. So, how does this restructuring of the mind work? What did, what did that? What practically did that look like? Well, in order to have good strategy you have to have good perceptions you have to actually know uh something you have to be right about what you know to base your strategy well what if the inputs what if what you know isn't really true mm. and what if your enemy is feeding you false information 
systematically to mislead even your most advanced experts to think that you, for example, to believe that ideology no matter no longer matters in the Soviet Union. That's one deception to to have you believe that China and Russia as communist countries are now ready to wipe each other out. They're at each other's throats to have you believe that a new liberal Soviet leader has emerged, that communism is now going to be changed. They're going to become a democracy, that the Communist Party is going to give up its power. If you can systematically feed the enemy the information, you can completely deceive him so that he will let down his guard and he will not even be able to defend himself. Because if you're psychologically disarmed, because you're operating with the wrong ideas and the wrong information, every single fact that comes to you will be framed incorrectly. You'll have the wrong context and you'll just be subject to a series of disinformation operations. You'll be led by the nose, in other words, strategically at all times. So let's go ahead and, and uh, sir, if we can roll the video of Galitzin talking about this exact subject. Go ahead and roll it. When Lenin launched into the West what is known as the Trust, um, he exported, he allowed uh, the emigration of a large number of emigres, and in their number were many controlled communist mm -hmm. members of the Cheka. And uh, he introduced this false controlled opposition to Western intelligence. And, West, and as a result, Western in the, the, the perception of Western in, by Western intelligence of what was really happening mm -hmm. was distorted. Now, this principle has been applied since 1961, and it came to its fruition under Gorbachev. Gorbachev's perestroika, which means restructuring, Stalin used the word perestroika, and it meant, um, in Stalin's vocabulary, it meant the reshoeing of a horse is in fact the restructuring not of Soviet society, although that was done for, uh, there was a certain amount of reform and restructuring to give it credibility. Superficial. It, superficial. It is it, essentially the restructuring of the Western mind, mm -hmm. the control of the Western mind. That is what it means. So I want to go into the, the idea about perestroika being a restructuring, not an actual fall of the Soviet Union. In his book, Anatoly Galitsyn, The Perestroika Deception, he says this, the, and, and I, I want everybody listening to the show to, and watching online right now to pay attention to this. For the United States to neutralize the influence of the anti-communist political right in the American political parties and to create favorable conditions for a victory of the radical left in the 1992 political elections— Guess who was elected in that year? Bill Clinton. To restructure the American military, political, economic, and social status quo to accommodate greater convergence between the Soviet and American systems and the eventual creation of a single world government. It, this this was, could not be clearer, and I believe we're seeing this play out today. Well, the communists are certainly trying to make it play out. Uh, the problem is that controlling people is like herding cats. Um, they're very good at deceiving people, and they're very good at moving their strategy forward. But it's, uh, many things went wrong with their strategy, um, so that it, 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 we're in overtime, you could say. They were hoping to have this all done with, you know, two decades ago. When they originally conceived the long-range strategy, they conceived it as a 40-year long-range strategy, which, by the way, they officially adopted in 1960. So they were looking to the year 2000. But, of course, they knew it could go longer. They, they understood uh, realistically that it could. But actually, the situation, what happened is that they were going to um, offer up the unification of Germany. They were going to sacrifice the Warsaw Pact alliance. In, in Eastern Europe, something that would be inconceivable as a gambit. And they, the Communist Party, according to Galitzin, who wrote this in 1984, before Gorbachev came on the scene, he said they're going to get rid of the Communist Party Soviet Union. They're even going to have that give up its monopoly of power. And, and of course, this meant the Berlin Wall was probably going to go down, which it did. And But what happened when that happened is that they overestimated some of their strength. 
um, Germany didn't immediately become totally under their control as they thought their agents would get control of it. The, the Soviet armies in Eastern Germany ended up on the territory of a NATO country, the unified Germany, and a lot of their people started to defect. This started an unraveling of their military. So there was a partial real collapse. A, um, a KGB colonel uh, a later explained to me, who was working at the time in Vienna, told me that he thought that it was, they'd suffered a bad defeat. And he asked the head of the KGB um, at the time, uh, Leonid Shabarshan, he said, have we suffered a defeat? And Shabarshan said, well, we've had a few setbacks, but the plan is still good. Now tell me about the banks in Vienna where we could filter this money from into the West and take over and own Western companies and buy politicians and so on. So they were really thinking in terms of we give up tank armies, we give up a position in Central Europe, but we have a stronger political position in America, in Germany, in France, in the UK, and also in the third world where they would be taking over countries in Latin America and Africa. So they were, they were building a position, they were sacrificing their position in Eastern Europe, which they, by the way, they were hoping wouldn't be a sacrifice because their agents would be in control. Now we see today Scholz in Germany, Macron in France. I think that they have those countries at least. In Tusk and, and Poland, you've got at least they're fouling up Poland by having Tusk as prime minister there. But we have to remember that this warfare is not just outside the West. They have heavily infiltrated us. You look at Joseph Biden, you look at Barack Obama, you look at uh, the Clintons. These people had serious communist links uh, during the Cold War. All of these people did. And uh, they were supported in getting into the White House by people like Armand Hammer, the Council for a Livable World, other fr communist front organization. Armand Hammer was a KGB agent, if you read uh, Edward J. Epstein's Hammer Files. So, so this is, you have to understand, this is a very complicated game. Most people don't even begin to understand all the elements that they had to have to even try to play this way. Well, and all of those elements really being in the intelligence sphere, which, you know, the quote was by Stanislav Lunov was, you never know if you're really winning or losing in espionage, but we can see some of the predictions at least from Golitsyn being played out. Mark Reibling in his book Wedge said that 139 of 148 of Galitzin's predictions were fulfilled by the end of 1993, an accuracy rate of 94%, and specifically these predictions, that the Berlin Wall would come down, East and West Germany would be re reunited, the Warsaw Pact would be dissolved, and there would be a perceived Sino-Soviet split. And I want to kind of go into that last one because I've seen that recently on Twitter by some uh, conservative pundits that, oh, we, we had the opportunity to bring China... Uh, you know, more into this, our sphere. Some say, no, actually it was Russia. We had the opportunity to bring Russia more into our sphere. And really that fake split, that fake Sino-Soviet split, I think has driven actually foreign policy decisions. So if you could go into that a little bit. Oh, yes, it definitely has driven it. Look, if um, a great game, a confidence game to play on people is if you're a thief, and you've got a partner in crime, but you want to make your target believe you two guys are enemies. And you want to get your, the person you're trying to steal from to trust one of you, right? So you have, you have a fight with your partner, but it's fake, so that the mark is taken in. So this is what they did to Nixon in, um, when Nixon went to China. They staged border incidences where they actually destroyed battalions between Russia and China. They had all this rhetoric between Mao and Brezhnev, uh, the two uh, communist governments, and they basically convinced Nixon that he was going in and saving China from being attacked by Russia, and that China was going to be grateful and that we could use that. Well, you see, if you're calculating your strategic position on the assumption that China is really on your side, you're calculating wrong. So the other side can turn the tables on you. And what Galitzin said is, is that at the end of this long-range strategy, when they've infiltrated you, when they have corrupted Europe, when they have gotten you to weaken your nuclear arsenal, and weaken your strength, 
China and Russia will then suddenly, out of nowhere, become one clenched fist. They will be united and they will be able to smash you because the balance of power will dramatically shift. And just to give you an idea, we haven't built a nuclear weapon in this country since 1992. Actually, September 92 was the last time we actually tested a nuclear weapon in the U.S. Our nuclear arsenal, according to Admiral Charles Richard, who was recently the head of the Strategic Command, in a February 2020 testimony, said that in three years, our arsenal will be obsolete. Well, here we're four years from that testimony. Our nuclear arsenal is obsolete. Our Minuteman missiles, half of our tests in the last five years of our ICBMs are test failures. The missile did not reach the target. So not only are our nuclear weapons past their shelf life, our missiles are way past our shelf life. Meanwhile, Russia's built new classes of nuclear weapons that we don't even have, like the road mobile SS-27 uh, ICBM. They have new, new, all kinds of new missiles, even in their submarines. The Chinese are now building nuclear missiles like sausages. They're expected to catch up with us in the next one and a half to two years. Russia's already ahead of us with new stuff. So now Russia and China combined, you've got double the number of nukes and missiles in China and Russia now than in the U.S. And the U.S. arsenal is rotted away. That's an example of what this strategy was intended to achieve. A, such a decisive shift in the strategic nuclear balance that we would be absolutely terrified of what they will do and forced into concessions. And I want to just read from the perestroika deception as well on page 35. It says, China, strategic enemy of the United States. Now, remember, this is written March 1989. Communist China is not a strategic partner, but a concealed strategic enemy of the United States. China will join in the Soviet offensive to bring about restructuring in the United States and worldwide. Through penetration, Chinese communist intelligence destroyed the CIA sources in China during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and prevented the agency developing reliable sources on the strategic intentions of the Chinese leaders. Now, this is fascinating to me because right now we are seeing the fruit of this with a scramble in the Pacific and, you know, the, the refurbishing of, of former U.S. bases that were used in World War II on some of the islands there, and also this increased rhetoric regarding strategic partnerships with Japan and the Philippines, and also the flashpoints that appear to be developing there in the South China Sea. So with this, China, it wasn't just Russia. China joined in the corruption, the penetration in the United States of America. Comment on that penetration. How, how deep really is it here in the United States? Well, I think that they made it into the White House. Um, look, uh, Barack Obama is a good example. He was trained by a communist named Frank Marshall Davis. Um, uh, he picked as his vice president Biden. If you look at the files that uh, um, Vladimir Bukovsky got out of the Communist Party Soviet Union archive, uh, it showed Biden was a collaborator during the Cold War, Senator Biden, with the Soviet officials, especially in a trip that he made in 1979 to the Soviet Union, there's a Central Committee document talking about him saying, well, I, I may have to talk bad about you, but really don't care what you do to your dissidents. And uh, Bukowski wrote an article about what this means, that in Soviet parlance, he was basically um, a collaborator with the Soviet government. Uh, the same thing could be said about Senator, Senator Ted Kennedy, who would go over to the Soviet Union and leak secrets to them. Um, this also was, has been revealed. Um, I, uh, a Czech documentary film producer once um, got, uh, got to uh, uh, sit down with former CIA director Robert Gates and asked him, well, did you know about this? Did you know about Kennedy, you know, committing treason? And he said, yes, but he's a Kennedy, right? Um, our political constraints in our system and the laxness of our system and the liberalism of, of our system means that we don't have good security and we don't have good intelligence when it comes to being impenetrated by enemy agents. That is, we don't have good counterintelligence. Um, the CIA has suffered so many defeats and setbacks, and we have double agents in our 
intelligence service that are actually working for other powers. We had Aldra James in the CIA. We had Robert Hansen in the, in the FBI. These are all things, by the way, that Galitzin said were, were ongoing, you know, when he was writing his books, which was true. Uh, he said, you're mulled out. And people said, oh, no, we're not mulled out. Yeah, we are. Not just politically, but also in our espionage. In fact, it was so bad during the Cold War, you know, that we found out at the end of the Cold War that every one of our spies in communist Cuba were doubled back on us. We didn't have any spies giving us genuine information. Same thing in East Germany. Every single one of our spies in East Germany were doubled back on us. Now, you look at Russia, you look at Romania or other communist regimes, probably the same thing or close to the same. Because when your CIA is penetrated, they immediately know who all your agents are in the different communist countries. And they can immediately either execute those agents or turn them back on you and feed you false information through them. This is called the feedback loop. And it's one of the ways they draw a, a picture for you of reality that's false. They do that by feeding you that through your own intelligence services. Well, let's bring it to modern times. I mean, it looks like President Biden is against Russia right now. He, he, he looks like he's against China right now. How do we account for that? And, and more importantly, how can the average American have some discernment points here to root out this deception as it comes across the news or social media? This is where everybody gets confused because look, if Biden acted like a pro Moscow guy, uh, he'd get caught. <laughs> It'd be easy to find out, find out what he was doing. No, if you go back to the record, Obama, remember when Obama was president, Biden was vice president, Hillary Clinton was secretary of state. You got a real trifecta there. They had the Russia reset. They helped Russia build their Silicon Valley. They gave billions for that. They helped with the Uranium One deal and there were other deals too. They were, they were feeding Russia. They were helping Russia. Then in about 2012, uh, Obama had that unfortunate slip where an active camera and a mic were open in South Korea. He was talking to President Dmitry Medvedev and saying, tell Vladimir, I just have to be elected one more time and then I can be flexible and give him what, I, what, he, wa what he wants. And this was caught on, on and it, was, it went around the world. It was just uh, amazing stuff. Well, about two months later, well, it was actually June of 2012 because that happened in March. Hillary Clinton does this visit to St. Petersburg with a delegation, only her delegation really just cools their heels while she went into a room with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov for two hours. She comes out of the room. She won't tell the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador, what she talked about. She won't tell any of the State Department officials what she talked about, about with Medvedev. But starting after that, you have this slow, gradual reversal Within about a year, will all the Democrats do this about face on Russia, where they're pro-Russia, they're helping Russia, and suddenly they're all against Russia, and they're accusing Republican candidates like Trump of being Russian stooges, right? So this happens all in a year. So it's like this magical thing. How is it that they all made this turn? And, of course, um, you can read about this meeting. And it wasn't just that. When John Kerry became Secretary of State in 2013, in Obama's second term he, term, he goes with Michael McFaul, our ambassador, to the Kremlin, meets with Putin, and then he spends two hours uh, walking alone, without a translator, by the way, like Hillary Clinton, alone with Sergey Lavrov, who has very good English. So to have, it's first, it's irregular for American Secretary of State to meet with a Russian leader without a witness, without a translator. Why no translator? Why this kind of level? This is the way an agent meets the person he's controlling. This is very suspicious because this happened, these two meetings with our two secretaries of state under Obama happened in the same year, one year period within which we made this about face. And it's, it's very suspicious because the Obama administration did not give any weapons to Ukraine when in 2014, Ukraine rebelled from Moscow. And for those people that think that the Obama administration helped the Ukrainians, no, they did not. And there's a, there's a very serious uh, misunderstanding of that tape of, um, 
of, of our ambassador, Mr. Piot, and he was talking to, what's her name? Uh, Newland? Uh, Nolan. Yeah. Nolan, right? They were just approached by Ukrainians because what happened in 2014 is the Ukrainian people were being bullied and actually being beaten down by this pro-Russian government in, in Kiev. And the Ukrainian, millions of Ukrainians stood up and said no to this. And they butchered about 100 people trying to put this down. And they, the country just got more and more, more against the government and the president, the prime minister, a bunch of governors, a bunch of uh, you know, secret police people, and they fled to Moscow. And so what happened is Ukraine was without a government and they asked the American diplomats there, what do we do? <laughs> and of course, that's all it was. It wasn't a coup that we did. And, but everybody misreads that because the Russians recorded that conversation framed it, created the context for it, and then put it out there. And of course, that's why we have to be very careful about this framing in the Russian propaganda. So, and what, what the objective was here is that Putin also, at the same time that they were shifting, that the Democrats were shifting and trying to pretend to be against Russia, Putin was shifting and pretending to be a Christian and conservative. Of course, he'd long yep. had this game of pretending to be a Christian, right? which we know he isn't. He's a murdering communist. Right. This is one of the things that people that I know who know him uh, when he was younger, this guy was a true believing communist. Well, that's why, if I uh, can interject real quick, that's why yeah. Tucker Carlson's first question should have been, why have you never renounced your affiliation with the Communist Party? Just a little interjection. Yeah, he, ne he never, yeah. In fact, uh, Putin made a, made a comment about this some years ago. I never burned my party card. I still yeah. have it. Right. And he said, um, oh, I, I didn't join the Communist Party because just to be in the KGB, I joined it because I like communist ideas. And then he would say things. There's a number of interviews he's done and uh, forums that he's done where he said he talked about being a Christian. And then towards the end, he says, well, being a Leninist, being a communist and a Christian is the same thing which is really a kind of shocking. You could go back and find the video of those. I, it was always fascinating the way he nuances his uh, positions. But if you look at like his deputies, the people around him, Igor Sechin is a good example, a self-professed Marxist-Leninist. Um, you look at the, the appointments he's made, his alliances. Look, two years in a row, they've given like 25, what is it, million tons of grain? No, 25,000 tons of grain to Cuba you know, when there's grain shortages in the world to make sure that Cuba has the grain that they need. Cuba is a communist country. They're giving weapons to Angola. They're helping the, they've been helping the FARC all along. They've got troops together with the Chinese in communist Venezuela. They're helping Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua build infrastructure in Nicaragua. He's being supplied with artillery shells from communist North Korea for his war, and he's aligned with China in which China has even said, if Russia is attacked, we will come to Russia's defense. I mean, Russia and China are united. So these are all communist countries. So how is that? If, he's, if all of his serious alliances and relationships are with communist countries, and by the way, even Iran, the mullahs, most of the mullahs were educated at Moscow State University. So right. how Muslim are they? How <laughs> communists are they? So we're looking at the communist bloc that has, was lying low for 30 years, and now it's, it's coming up. And we're hearing about communism more and more, and we've got it in our own streets, like in the summer of 2020, when Black Lives Matter and Antifa rioted and tore down statues of George Washington and Ulysses S. Grant and Teddy Roosevelt. Those were communist actions inside the U.S. And General Mihai Pachipa admitted that they had, by 1969, infiltrated, what was it, 4,000 communist agents into the Middle East to serve as a buffer against the United States. I mean, that's what he said in his book. And among those, Yasser Arafat, etc. Oh, yeah. Arafat and the PLO were communist organizations, basically. Uh, Arafat was trained in Moscow by the Soviets, um, and Pachipa was very good on that. Um, the thing about... Uh, you know, it's many of the defectors are like the story of the blind man and the elephant, where <laughs> each blind man is holding a different part of the elephant. Right. You know, one is holding the trunk and he thinks he's got a hose. Another one's got the tail. He thinks he's got a rope. 
you know, they're holding onto the leg and they think it's a tree trunk. Um, so, it, it, but, but you need to actually look at all the defector literature to put together your elephant to see what you're yep. looking at. And you also have to look at China and talk to Chinese defectors. And there are some good ones now. Um, and the, but the problem is, is that you could say, okay, so the CIA must know this. They must understand the defectors. They must believe it. No, because there's two things about America and its intelligence you need to know. First, a lot of the CIA isn't a right wing organization. A lot of lefties, actually, a majority of lefties, are the CIA. The CIA is very left, just like a lot of our uh, military officers above the rank of colonel. Uh, it's because of our education system. It's because of our culture, which has moved more and more to the left. Um, and it's, uh, was it uh, Glenn Grossclose wrote a book, Tur Left Turn, where he turned it into statistics and he showed that the, um, the Republican Congress of 1999 was more to the left than the Democratic Congress of 1980. Wow. Right? So you have to understand how we've been conditioned without even realizing it. And so, um, so the CIA has this ideology problem where they have the wrong ideas and they don't see things, so they won't accept certain things because and I was in graduate school uh, seeking a PhD in political science and I saw how people with PhDs were indoctrinated. They weren't allowed to think or ask certain questions because their master professors were mar actual Marxist, closet Marxists for the most part, were actually communists. Um, the other thing is, is that the political, our political system is conditioned by our economic system, which is the people with the money, the, the banks, the, the financial elite and the industrial elite, they wanted to invest in China. When the Soviet Union went down, they wanted to invest in Russia. They want, their, they want to invest in the best deals they can get. They want access to cheap labor and so on. So if somebody came along, if someone in the CIA had was an analyst or a defector would say, Russia and China are really together, don't invest in them, they're going to cheat you. Um, the president and the other political appointees that had all the agencies would go, that's garbage, we don't want to hear that anymore. Because they're, they're, in order to hold their office, they have to please these financial people. And they have to, and these financial people are saying, I'm not going to support you as a candidate for president or whatever if you don't, you know. And so they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear the bad news. And if there's plenty of left of center analysts saying, oh, anti communism is just crackpot nonsense. Um, you see how it happens that you get you have a completely skewed thing and then you have the KGB feeding all kinds of false messages to contradict any true analysis and true messages at the same time active measures exactly active measures and is that why the these pundits on the right are refusing to see this right now which also begs the question why did they label Putin a Russia or not Putin but excuse me Trump a Russia lover and a friend of Putin yeah, see, it's very funny is that they should have, I mean, a few people realized that, there, that this was false. They, look, at there was no evidence that Putin collaborated with Russia. There were, there were things. He went to Moscow and he, he sold some of his real estate deals were probably used for, by Russians to launder money, but that wasn't his doing. I mean, you know, most of the real estate companies in the United States have been uh, used to launder money without them knowing it, right? Right. I mean, that's just it is. But they they set up this great narrative. And the thing that really bothers me is uh, they they said that the Dem Democrats set up this narrative when they had been collaborating their whole careers with the Soviet Union and then Russia. Then they reverse it on them. And then these these I hate to say it, uh, poorly educated conservatives start going along with it and saying, yeah, we are for Russia. Because, you know, they're, they, they're against homosexuality and they're really Christians. Well, I'm sorry to break it to you, but in 20, uh, before, the, um, before the pandemic, only 4% of Russians went to church on, uh, on Easter. You know, there's yeah. more than 10 times as many Americans went to church on Easter that year. So the idea that Russia is a Christian country, that Putin is a Christian, it's a misunderstanding. And, the, and there's different kinds of perversion. Certainly there's corruption in the U.S. There is everywhere. But there's, there's this propaganda that they, uh, they targeted the right. And 
you know, one of the things, the, the communists are practiced at recruiting alienated people to be communists. So a situation has arisen while the American right is alienated psychologically. And so now they're just turning their expertise in recruiting alienated people to get them to accept a new set of narratives. And that, that somehow communism is no longer a threat. And I want to kind right. of go, I want to go in that direction quickly. My own personal experience, my wife is from Ukraine, was in the underground church in the former Soviet Union. And when they invaded in 2014, they invaded in Eastern Ukraine, Putin was shutting down non-Orthodox churches. That happened. I know the pastors. I talked to oh, them. Yes. And, and he was shutting those things down. And then when you see Zelensky for his, I'm not talking about any of his failings, but for, for Zelensky, he shuts down those churches inside Ukraine, that was exactly the right move because those aren't churches. Those are intelligence gathering organizations right. and always have been, or at least have been in the modern era. Yeah, the, or the Orthodox Church from the very beginning of the Bolshevik regime, uh, especially when Stalin brought, brought, brought back the church uh, during World War II, uh, was a KGB operation. Um, the regular members could believe, might be true believers, but the uh, hierarchy of the Russian Orthodox Church was KGB controlled, was under control of the Soviet regime. And that's true today. And of course, uh, Zelensky had no choice but to shut down. Um, and unfortunately, it was, the, it was the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which was the part of the Ukrainian Church that was in um, communion with the Russian Orthodox Church. And that meant that it was just an extension of Russian intelligence. And they found that they were doing all these operations against Ukraine, so they had to do something. Um, and this is what we need to take a lesson from this, because they've been using religion. The communists have been infiltrating our churches. Not only, you know, you look at the World Council of Churches, you look at, of course, when the Russian Orthodox Church abroad was assimilated by the Moscow Patriarchy. It was, uh, you know, you had people like uh, Konstantin Priyabrzhensky warning Americans, warning them, saying, don't do this, don't let this happen. Konstantin Priyabrzhensky was another KGB uh, officer who now lives in the United States, who is really very knowledgeable on this particular subject. But yes, it's their, their manner of infiltrating that. Look, the communists go to infiltrate religion, uh, big business, the military, intelligence, politics, education science yep everything they don't and, leave anything out and they're they're following of course antonio gramsci's long march through the institutions that they believe they can capture them and you know yeah. the chinese since con the common turn in in 1919 have been working with the russians have been working with the soviets and and the the remnants of them even to this day to have a one world government just like galitzin put in his book just like he said and so I, yeah. I want to, because we only have a couple minutes left. This is a fantastic conversation. I want to bring it to the present day. We have dramatic infiltration at all levels in business and in government and even in the church, um, even with the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, Trevor Loudon's done a great job exposing that. But I want to go to the next step. What's going to happen next? Is this going to be World War Three, World War Four? And then you have this congressional testimony in 2000 where two congressmen, but specifically citing Stanislav Lunev and then asking him the question, and General Lebed said there were 84 unaccounted for suitcase nukes inside the United States of America. And would that be a trigger event? What, what, is, what is the play here? I mean, are we really going to war in the next year or in the next three years? I mean, that's possible. Uh, look, um, strategically, when the Russian strategy, the Soviet strategy was invented, there were, there were two legs of it. One was uh, Clausewitz, the other was Sun Tzu. Uh, Sun Tzu was Dmitry Miranov, Clausewitz was Marshal Sokolovsky, VD Sokolovsky, who was the leading Russian military strategist. And it, it depends on which one is right. The, the KGB thought we can win without a nuclear war. Uh, and, and Marshal Sokolovsky said, no, it's fine. You could do all your deception tricks, but at the end, basically I'm, I'm making a story up. 
if you get a if you trick a person into digging a hole, lying down on it, the minute you start pouring dirt on his face to bury him, he's going to stand up and grab the shovel out of your hand. So Sokolovsky said, remember what Lenin and Marx said, the bourgeoisie will fight you when they realize they're going to lose everything. So uh, I side with Clausewitz. I think Clausewitz was more profound than Sun Tzu. You got a people quoting Sun Tzu all over the all over the place who dominated in the 19th century, not China, the Western countries, and they were following the philosophy of war of Clausewitz. So Clausewitz is right, and it's being proved right, because all this deception is breaking down. They've done about as much deception as they can do. Right. They've gotten about as far as they can. And the big problem with deception is, okay, some Russian girl pops out of a cake and says, surprise, right? <laughs> You've got all these bad people in Berlin and Paris and Moscow, but does Biden want his own bodyguards to kill him? Because they can't follow through on their treason. They can't deliver America to Moscow without committing a kind of treason that gives them away and ends them up in jail. So in the end, they got to say, well, I'm on your side and you paid me, but you didn't pay me that much, you know, to commit suicide. And they will try to, they have tried to help Russia as much as they can. But let's face it, these people in Russia and China are bad, these communists. And they are so greedy and they can't help themselves but expose themselves by all the cheating the Chinese do economically, by all the military preparations. People can see it now and they're scared. And so we are inclining on this war thing. And China's economy is suffering because communists don't understand economics. They try capitalism, but they don't really know how to run it right. And so they end up with all these nuclear weapons and their economic options are going away. So this is the real danger that they are going to go, all right, then it's one clenched fist. We'll just have to nuke them. That is a danger. It's a real danger. Now, General, I don't know if it's Key or Chi's secret speech. He Chi. Chi Chi. Yeah, Chi Hotian. Okay, so he specifically, and the, where, the place I found it was actually on your blog, by the way. So it, it does work. Some people are reading it, just to encourage you. All right. He, he said in his secret speech... Essentially, that if they began to lose power, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party began to lose power, they would go to war to preserve yes. power. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Everything he said, there's other sources that are affirming the same thing. And I'm I'm hearing this constantly now. I mean, uh, Mr. Uh, Wang of Luda Media, I've done a number of interviews with him, uh, Dr. Li Mengyan, um, you know, those people that know China, uh, people from Epoch Times, uh, this is a real danger. Um, uh, Chia Chen said that their uh, strategy was to use a biological attack to try to kill 100 to 200 million Americans. Well, we saw the pandemic. My question is, was that the attack they were planning? Mm -hmm. And did that attack fail? Because, you know, as I understand biological warfare, the human immune system made by God is a tremendously amazing thing. And if you make a, um, a chimera virus, it rapidly mutates towards the common cold after you release it. So maybe it was lethal when you first released it, but it rapidly mutated to being the common cold. I suspect, I'm not sure, but I suspect this is what happened. I suspect their biological attack may have failed. There's also the question of China being involved in making vaccine precursors, mm -hmm. being involved in the making vaccines yep. if they could get everybody to take the same vaccine at once and they can poison that vaccine they could kill 100 to 200 million americans but i'm not sure that that could work out for them because americans now are leery of vaccines um so uh you know this idea of you have to be creative when you think about biological warfare you have to be very creative and uh what she said is this is our ideal, but if the biological attack, if we get caught or it doesn't work, it's going to be a nuclear war. And he talked about losing 700 million Chinese. Because they could absorb that kind of a loss just by sheer numbers of people. Jeff, we've run out of yeah. time. I want to thank you for being on. Absolutely fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for educating us today. And I really appreciate everything you're doing. Keep up the fight. Thank you.